Uh, bonjour tout le monde, je suis enchanté d'être ici à uh, Montréal, uh, mais je regrette bien que je ne parlerai pas uh, français parce que, un, je ne suis pas politicien et deux, uh, je ne voudrais pas massacrer une belle langue. Well, uh, this is an interesting challenge for all of us at the moment. I, I want to talk about creating skills for the future. And you are all probably part of organizations that are disruptors. You are changing th things that are happening. But also this disruption taking place in education and training as well. And I want to talk about that. And I'm going to have to work out how to work this. There we go. Right. I want to start with two quotations, actually. One from the president of uh, IBM Canada. There's a critical need for us to re reinvent our approach to education, training, reskilling, and recruiting to create the skills for the future. And the second from a Royal Bank of Canada report that came out earlier this year, Canadian employers are unprepared to recruit and develop the skills they need to make their organizations more competitive. So what should we be doing? Now, in 30 minutes, I'm not going to give you the solution to that problem. But what I do want to do is to give at least one key message to you to take away when you go home, and we'll get to that in a, in a moment. So first of all, here's what I want to cover in, in the 30 minutes or so. First of all, uh, major changes happening in the workforce, and particularly the demands of a digital economy. Second, the impact of digital learning. Um, the digital revolution is affecting education and training as much as it's affecting any other area. What are the implications for organizations of these changes? And I'm going to suggest the one message is that each organization now needs to build an effective learning environment for their employees. And I'll end up with some very brief suggestions of what an organization should do to create that uh, learning environment. If we look at virtually any employment area, we'll see that the knowledge-based component is growing and growing. Uh, it doesn't matter which area you work in, that knowledge-based component now is becoming the key driver of the change and the tr key driver of business. And the problem is that knowledge base is expanding more rapidly than we as human beings have a capacity to handle. So that's leading to the development of new work and new knowledge and skills. We're creating jobs now that have never existed before, requiring skills that nobody's had before. People are having to learn as we go to some extent. Um, I'm going to talk about a report from the Royal Bank of Canada. Interesting study. What they did, they went to look at all the job adverts on LinkedIn for the past year and a half and looked at the skills that employers were looking for. So big data here. They looked at a massive number of job adverts and identified the skills that employers think they will need in the next five years. I also want to talk a little bit about the impact of automation and artificial intelligence on jobs and work. And the good news is that the Royal Bank of Canada, anyway, thinks that there will be a big demand for jobs in the future, but we're not preparing properly for those jobs. And that's what I want to talk about. Within 10 years, 50% of the jobs that we've got now will require new skills or new jobs will be created requiring skills that we haven't actually got at the moment. The second big message is that digital competency is essential for all jobs. Now, that doesn't mean to say programming. I'll come back to that in a minute. But it does mean to, that people can think and work in a digital environment and can think digitally. The Royal Bank also said that human skills will be even more important in the future to bridge the gap between technology and us and the way we behave as human beings. And there will be constant change in work. Now, what did the Royal Bank of Canada find? Now, you're not going to be able to see the detail of this. The dark blue means very important, and the very light blue means not required. And 
the kinds of skills they're looking at are things like uh, active listening, um, time management, and so on at one end. And the, some of the skills at the other end that are not required or not so important really surprise me. Programming is one of them. Apparently, programming itself, coding, is not going to be that important. It will be important for a very small number of people who will be highly skilled at programming. But a lot of programming will become automated, for instance. So it's not what you would think. And I really strongly recommend you read that report to see what kind of skills are being required in the workforce. And what they talked about particularly is what they call transversal skills. That is, the skills that an employee can take and move from job to job, um, because those skills will be needed wherever they work. And that's not what I want to talk about today, because the universities and colleges are trying to develop those skills. What I want to talk about are the skills that are specific to your business or enterprise or whatever you're doing, and how you develop those skills. The second thing that's happening is technology is impacting on learning and three key developments, online learning, um, open education, and multimedia. And they're all affecting how learning is taking place now. Uh, I was recently involved in two surveys, one last year, one this year, of online learning in the Canadian post-secondary system. We surveyed all the colleges and universities in Canada and we found that um, nearly all Canadian universities and colleges, except interestingly in Quebec, now offer online courses for credit. The universities do in Quebec, um, not so much the CGEPs um, or the private uh, colleges. Uh, La Salle is, is one exception. Um, across the Canadian post-secondary system, about one in five students now is taking at least one online course. And online teaching now comprises about 10% of all the teaching, fully online, about 10% of all the credit-based teaching in universities and colleges across Canada. The other area that's growing rapidly is hybrid learning. That's where students do some work on campus, but a lot of work online. And two-thirds of the institution report that online learning is going to be critical for their future. So it's really happening in a big scale um, in Canadian post-secondary education. The second area is one you're probably less familiar with, and that's open education. Open textbooks in British Columbia now, every first and second year university and college course has an open textbook that students can download for free. Um, open research, if you get a research grant now from the federal government, you must publish in an open access journal. Um, the research must be openly available if you get a research grant. Open education resources. These are materials that are free for educators and trainers to use. Um, they are copyrighted, but they're, they're, they're licensed through a Creative Commons license to enable uh, free use under certain conditions. You can't commercialize them, for instance, if they got a, if they got a particular kind of license. Now, the importance of this hasn't really sunk in into most places, especially in universities. Basically, content, all content, is going to be open, free, and abundant. In other words, you can look it up on Google. It, it, and that is fundamental, because all your employees now can find stuff. They can go online and get it. So the, 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 the issue is not the content, but how they find it, how they analyze it, how they decide whether it's relevant or not. And those are skills. Um, and teaching and learner support or training and learner support will be a quality differentiator within organizations, de depending how well they can manage that open access to information. And again, the big thing I want to talk about is what do companies do openly and share um, and in order to develop their learners, uh, their, their employees, and what do they have to keep to themselves because it's their business and they don't want anybody else having it. And that's really, we're going to widen that open area and narrow that closed area for successful companies over time. And I think that open education is actually going to be the real game changer, that there is so much material out there now that um, you can access easily. The, the second big development is what's happening with technology itself, and particularly multimedia. Print and talk have historically been dominant in education, 
And there are good reasons for that, particularly at universities. It's abstract, good for abstract thinking, good for linear thinking. But knowledge can now be represented in many different ways, through text, audio, video, computing, and increasingly augmented and virtual reality. And what the research shows is that if somebody learns through different media, they learn deep, more deeply and understand better than if they learn through one single medium. The other thing about media is that you can record it. And that has a big impact on learning in many ways. It allows learners to repeat and practice, and it allows time away from class. In other words, they can do work on their own. I'll give you one example of this. Um, my grandson in England had just started, or started two years ago, uh, doing physics, traditional physics teaching. The professor comes in, covers the board in formula, um, and walks out. So I come home, and there he is on the computer, and I say, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm working through my examples, my, uh, my uh, calculus examples. And I said, oh, is your professor teaching you online? He says, no, and he laughed. He said, no, no. So I said, does he know you're doing this? And where are you getting examples from? He said, well, that the, comes with the textbook. The textbook has a, has a website, and I can go on and work all, out all these examples online. So I said, well, so, so what are the lectures like? He said, well, I only go to one in three. I said, what, one in three? That's a funny number. He says, well, yes. He said, uh, I've got two friends, and the lectures are so bad that what we do, we, we do understand roughly the topics he's talking about, and then we exchange the topics, and then we look it up on the internet. And we go, and he's using MIT open courseware lectures. He's using lectures from MIT to, because his professor isn't a good enough teacher for him, right? So, the, you know, the kids are doing it. They're going out and finding the stuff anyway, whether, whether you teach it or not. Um, the, the other thing is that interactive media can provide feedback. Uh, we'll see more and more use of serious games, particularly uh, in training. Um, very nice example in uh, British Columbia. Uh, the Justice Institute of BC trains fire, police, uh, emergency people, and so on. And they have a, a course on, on emergency response systems. And everybody's working. They're all in their offices and so on. They know that at 10 o'clock on Monday, they've got a JIBC exercise. So if you want to rob a bank, that's a really good time to do it because all the police are doing their exercises. So they, 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 they've got iPads, and their iPads blink, and it's a news item, and it's a fire in the uh, docks in, in Vancouver. And they have to respond, and there's a there's a guy uh, controlling the simulation, so they all rush to the bridges, as you know in Vancouver it's all bridges, and one of the bridges is, is blocked by an accident because of the fire. So they've got to respond in real time. All this is recorded, then eventually they'll come into the Justice Institute and they'll go over all their procedures. They've been taught the procedures beforehand, but this is an, a real-time simulation and it's really improved the response times and the um, ability of people to respond to emergencies in Vancouver. So that's a good use of simulations and games. And some media, like virtual reality, allow you to move into spaces that will be very difficult if you, without virtual reality. Now, the important thing is all these technologies needed, need to be linked to specific skills development. In other words, the decision about whether to use a technology is what skill is this helping, me, helping us develop for our employees and our workers, and how relevant is that to, to, to what we're doing? Now, we know a lot about skills development. We know, for instance, um, that you need to distinguish between content and skills, or knowledge and skills. Content, I see as facts, ideas, principles. It's about knowing things, whereas skills is and things like not just mechanical skills, but soft skills, such as understanding, analyzing, evaluating, applying, doing things. Now, both are necessary in today's society, but particularly in the post-secondary system, in universities particularly, content has been the traditional priority. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that we have to pay much more attention to these soft skills I don't know why they're called soft skills. Some independent thinking, critical thinking, they're very difficult skills, but they're not mechanical skills. Now, we know a lot about how to teach skills. We know that, to some extent, they're context-specific. Let me give you an example. 
Problem solving in business is not the same as problem solving in medicine for two reasons. First of all, the content's different. You have to have different content in medicine from business. But secondly, the attitude to problem solving is different. Medicine is risk averse. In business, you can't be risk averse. You have to be willing to take a certain degree of risk if you were to succeed. So again, there are some elements of problem solving that are common, but there are things that are very specific and context-based. We do know that learners leads, lead, need lots of practice if they're going to um, uh, develop a skill. Small steps initially and bigger steps later. Very critical is regular feedback from a, an expert, from somebody who is more experienced. And the other thing, we talk about competencies often. The big thing in the States at the moment is competency-based learning. This is where employers work with um, a college or a university to specify the skills they actually want, and they go for 100% compliance with those skills. Now, let me ask you, uh, look at uh, a hockey player like Wayne Gretzky. Does he go for 100% competency? No. He, he, he wants to get better and better and better. A real skill has no end goal. You keep getting better and keep getting better. You keep working at it over a lifetime. You're not going to teach a really important skill like critical thinking, for instance, in one course. You're going to have to do it over a, over a lifetime, basically. And I'll come back to what that means in terms of employment later. So how do we develop skills? What teaching methods work for developing skills? What's the relationship between content and skills? What role can technology play in developing and assessing skills? What do we assess and how? That's less of a problem in the workforce. It's definitely a problem in universities at the moment. Paper and pencil tests are not going to get to most of the skills we want people to develop. And skills require specific methods of teaching and training. So what are the implications for organizations? Well, first of all, higher education, the post-secondary system, is beginning to prepare for the digital economy. But come on, guys, they're 800 years old. They're not going to move fast enough, right? We know that. I mean, they are trying, and, but it's around the edges. It's, it's not the whole institution is suddenly changing. There are administrators who are trying to do that, but they've got faculty who are independent, thank goodness, and don't want to change. And so it's a big struggle. Secondly, their focus is different. They're focusing on students' needs. So they're focusing on getting the students to be able to survive when they leave university and go on into the workforce. But they're not focusing specifically on corporate and uh, or business and organizational needs. So this puts the responsibility back onto employers here. And what I'm going to argue, and this is the one point I want you to take away, is that employers need to create a culture within their organizations that supports the learning of their employees so they can get better and better at the skills they've got and the skills they will need in the future in their jobs because this is an ongoing and continuous and never-ending activity. And this requires, in my view, building in each organization a learning environment so that it's part of the job to learn. That, that's what you're... When you come into a company, you know that this is going to be part of your job. You're going to have to go on learning all the time. And then how do you manage that learning? How do you create that culture within an organization? So let me say a little bit more about learning environments. And let me ask you a question here. What is knowledge? Because everybody thinks they know what knowledge is, but in fact, it's a rather tricky concept. And particularly, how does learning occur? And I want to give two analogies here. One I think is incorrect, and one I think is correct. You can look at knowledge as coal. It's out there. It's like it's just got to be dug up, put into a truck, transported, and delivered. In other words, if you're a trainer, you find the content, you deliver it to your learner, and They've got the coal and they can use it whatever way they want. Or you can see it as developmental. Um, let's take the concept of heat. When you're a baby, you touch something and it's hot, right? So you understand what hot means. You get a bit older and you realize you can put numbers on heat so that 40 degrees 
uh, centigrade is hot and minus 20 is cold, unless you live in Quebec, in which case it's normal in the winter. <laughs> but, so so you, you, you learn a bit more about heat. Then you go to university and you learn about the properties of heat. So our knowledge of a particular concept is always developing. So I see teaching and training more like gardening than coal mining. You know, you, you nurture it. Basically, people will learn. If you put them in the right environment, we are a learning cre creatures. That's what we do. We learn. So you have to create the environment to encourage that learning. Now, there's lots of alternative learning environments. There's military training. There's an online course. Or there's team-based learning when people learn in a team from each other. Now, there's lots of different environments. And what I want you to think of is, what would be the appropriate learning environment for my organization, for my company, for my business? What, what should a learning environment look like that would fit the needs of my company? So as I said, there's lots of campus and schools that obviously they're learning environments. There's experience, there's family and life, we learn from that. There's work-based learning environments. Online personal learning environments where individuals set up, their, they've got their mobile phones, they've got their um, access to social media, and they're learning from that. But they all need certain column elements to support learning if learning is to be effective. Now, I put up here one learning environment. It's a, it's a it's if you, university, or college, or school learning environment. You'll see there are lots of elements. There's the needs of the, the learners, the characteristics of the learners. Um, are they working full-time? Are they part-time? There's content, there's skills, there's learner support, there's the resources available, there's assessment. Now, that might not be appropriate for your organization. You might have to do this differently. I think most of the things will apply, but they'll apply in a different context, in a different way. So you should start thinking about what your learning environment would look like for your company and for your employees so they can go on learning. And the important thing, that the, the blue in this, is the culture of the organization. Um, and that really affects how learning takes place. And I'll give you one example which is terrible. It's a terrible example. And that's the residential schools, the culture of the residential schools. They were supposed to be learning environments, but they destroyed the children. So the culture was completely um, dominant there, uh, and, it dis and it really affected the way that learning took place in those um, institutions. So what is the culture in your organization? Does it destroy learning, or does it support it? So technology provides different contexts for learning environments. Now, let me mention learning management systems. They get a hard knock in a lot of universities because faculty feel they constrain them. But learning management systems, for instance, is, provide a very interesting learning. First of all, they're secure. So if you're a company, you can keep your company training within the bounds of the company. You have to have a password to log in and so on. But also, they're a record. They're a record of what happens. And so they're a way of managing the, the growing knowledge in your company. If, com if your employees are using a learning management system to learn from each other, for instance, through the discussion forums, then you've got a way of retaining that knowledge within the company. Because one of the big problems is that half your employees are going to leave within two years. And with them goes all that knowledge that they've gained while they've been working with you. So how are you going to contain and manage that knowledge when your employees are in constant shift? There's virtual worlds, that's another kind of learning environment. Um, and I mentioned personal learning environments. Now, these still need to be filled with um, components, and that's the trainer's responsibility. And there's a limit. I mean, having a learning environment is great, but you've got to do things in it. Um, it's necessary, but not sufficient. So you still need good course design, you good, need empathy, for, for learners, you need competency in, in, in the subject areas, and you need imagination to create relevant content and so on. So all those things still have to be done. But in the end, it's the learners that have to do the learning. It's the employees who have to do the learning. And what you're looking for is a new learning environment that creates conditions for successful learning for your employees. So what do organizations need to do? 
Well, first of all, I think they need to ensure that workers can learn individually, take responsibility for their own learning, work out what they need to learn in order to do their work, uh, and provide the opportunities to do that. And online learning is particularly good for that because it gives them flexibility about how and when to learn. And if you manage it properly, you can see what, what they're learning as well. So you can check that they are doing the work, if you like. The second is learning from each other within the company. Now, you probably know about Google. Google has some very interesting communities of practice. It's got 20,000 of the brightest PhDs in, in, in the world. And what it does, it, it, it puts them together in the social media to learn from each other. So if somebody has a problem somewhere, doesn't really understand the latest coding, but they need that for what they're doing, they just put it up on their, um, on, on their in, internal network, and any employee in the company can respond and help prov provide the solution to that problem, for instance. So they're they, what they're doing is generating and making use of all the knowledge that's in the company and getting people to share that knowledge. So building a community of practice has two elements. One is what you do within the company, and secondly, a lot of people will learn from other companies, and there are things that you want to share with other companies in learning and things you don't want to share. So again, part of the responsibility of the training organization is to work out what should be done outside the company and what should be done inside. I'll give you another example of that. Volkswagen is not, probably not a good example after they're cheating with emissions, but Volkswagen at one point wanted to set up some kind of organization that would bring in the oil companies, uh, the airline companies, the bus companies, and the um, motor companies to look at the future of transport. So they could adapt to the future. They'd be ready for the future. They knew they had to go outside the company to learn about what other people were doing if they were to survive as a successful company. So you, you can have a community of practice outside as well as inside the institution. And then, of course, you have a lot of experts within your company, and they have an important role in mentoring and so on. And how do you structure that? How do you formalize that so that people are learning from one another? And incidentally, the smaller the company, the more important it is to have a strategy for learning within that company. Because if you've only got 10 people and two of your key people leave over the next year, how do you ensure that the knowledge that those people have brought to the company stays within the company? So organizations need to ensure that corporate knowledge is codified, stored, and protected. That's really important. Do you have a strategy for doing that in your company? And that's, if you like, what I will call the negative side. You're closing things in. But what's the culture of learning in your company? Are people rewarded, encouraged, and so on to learn? Do you have lots of opportunities for people to get together to learn? Do you have a structure to support it? So in conclusion, um, work and the needs of the workforce are rapidly changing. Uh, technology offers opportunities to build flexible, adaptive, work-focused learning environments, but this requires a corporate strategy uh, for supporting learning focused on the needs of that organization. It's not going to be the same answer for every company. It's going to be a different answer probably for every company, but it needs to be tailored to the needs of that company. And whatever that strategy is for supporting learning, it must include skills as well as, as, well as content, as well as knowing things. You have to be able to train people to do things in your company. Thank you, thank you very much.